thank you guys for having me here today. My name is uh, Thomas Burnett, and I'm going to be talking about uh, my company's uh, robotic program that we have going on here. Um, on the, on the, as far as the agenda is concerned, I'm going to do a quick intro into my little company, and then I'm going to be talking about our pro, our Crow robotics uh, program. And so Crow stands for Carry, Roam, Observe, and it consists of uh, four uh, sub-programs, if you will. One of which is to develop a, what we call a personal carry mule, which is a small robot designed to follow people and carry heavy loads. Uh, and then the Mark One Rover is a simple RC-based uh, research robot that we use for doing uh, uh, software development mainly. Um, Cross is our mobile operating system we designed specifically for ARM processors. And then Pathfinder is our autonomous uh, vehicle navigation uh, trail pa uh, pathfinding uh, uh, work that we're doing for the PCM. And I can take uh, questions throughout the talk, or I can uh, take questions after, after I'm done talking about Crow. And then if we have time left over, then I'd also be happy to talk about uh, the light field display research that we do at, uh, at Phobia 3D. As far as the intro into my company, um, we're a small uh, research company in Austin, Texas. Uh, we primarily do uh, field of view or uh, uh, light field display uh, uh, research and development for uh, government and commercial contracts. Um, I'm the I'm one of the founders. I'm uh, got a BS in software engineering from Texas A&M about 30 years ago. But my my typical role I play is a principal investigator, which means a you know principal researcher, or as a systems engineer. So I have to have uh, you know good visual coverage over you know the optics and electronics, mechanics, and the, and the software of a fairly complex system. Uh, my, my partner, Amy Lesner, has also been in uh, light field displays for almost as long as I have. Uh, and, um, and yeah, and so we've, we've recently, uh, 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 in the last year or two, have broadened our research uh, and, and development efforts from just display technology to, to, um, to robotics. And people often ask me, well, wh where's the tie-in there? You know, how did you go from displays to... To, to robotics. And the, the, the quick answer is, is that the DOD is always asking me what the difference between a light field camera is and a light field display. And the, the, the easy answer is to say, well, a light field cap camera, you know, captures 3D information and a light field display, you know, displays or projects like uh, 3D information. And then the next question I get a lot is, okay, well, if you have a light field camera, what, what is it really good for? My, my, my quick question is, well, you know, they would be really good for, you know, reducing the cost complexities of sensor arrays on the front of, of robotic systems. And, and so that, that's how I got tied into to robotics was, was through light field camera questions. Uh, to that end, because I'm a research organization, um, I primarily respond to research topics that are solicited by the U.S. government. And so you, you may have heard of the CIBR program or, you know, broad uh, BAA programs or, you know, DARPA programs, what have you. I typically work on those kind of things. And so recently, uh, uh, a, a solicitation came across that basically uh, stated that they wanted to have a, a, a robot that was designed to alleviate the need for soldiers to carry much of their personal gear. The deal is, is that, um, you know, because the soldiers routinely carry heavy loads over difficult terrains, they, they often uh, are, you know, uh, have medical conditions, you know, muscular, uh, skeletal or muscular uh, issues, which can, you know, result in long-term injuries for them. And so the idea is if you have a mule carrying their stuff, then, then they are, you know, they basically preserve their health for the well-being and well-being for their missions. And so part of the sort of the requirements for the, the, the mule program that they solicitation that they had was, you know, it has to be able to, to carry uh, a, a heavy load, say hundred pounds or, or more over, you know, say 30 to 35 kilometers, which, you know, has a secondary requirement of, well, okay, then it must be able to go all day long. But there's also other requirements that you kind of derive from a program like this uh, because you're used to dealing with the army. So one of the other things is, is that, um, it, the, all the processing power must be self-contained. So, you know, a lot of programs that we have, you know, uh, we do data capture on a robot and then we, we send that data to some big 
big system and they do all the number crunching there and they send us back some nice little tel telemetry to, to, you know, to, to, to use to navigate the robot. But in a system like this, it's gonna be deployed out in the field, you know, all the processing must be contained in the, in, the, in the unit. And the other issue is, is that um, because everything's contained in the same, uh, this, this, uh, 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 this small system and it's gonna to have to go all day, then the conservation of battery power becomes one of the primary engineering concerns that you, you, have, to, you have to consider. And so when we, you know, uh, looked at all the, 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 the stated requirements and sort of the derived requirements, we came up with our, our Crow PCM project. And you can see here a couple of, you know, artist renditions of what this thing would look like if we actually designed it. And so, you know, in a, in a nutshell, uh, it's, 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 it's a, you know, uh, uh, high, you know um, uh, it's, it's made out of the same material that you would make, uh, Make bulletproof vests, so it's you know high strength, you know low weight. Um, it's on a four by two chassis, which means and with standard say Ackerman geometry, steering geometry. So it's it's nothing exotic there. It uses uh, you know in you know electronic wheel hub motors, so you know there's no big bulky motors hanging off the thing, and everything's sort of designed to be you know very compact and very efficient. And so the idea uh, would be that, you know, it would have all the sensors on the front, maybe a couple sensors on the back and all the compute is in there. The batteries are in there. And one of the other uh, th uh, things that we said was, is, you know, because he's gonna be de deployed overseas and they must be easy to ship, you know, they have to be easy to ship and survive ship shipping and be able to, you know, uh, be easy to assemble. So one of the other things that we did is say, look, all the components that are on the robot can be disassembled and, 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 and carried within the carry volume of the robot. Um, and then, you know, everything has to be light enough for a person to do one man lifts so they don't injure themselves or get, you know, the same you know, spinal injuries that they would get carrying their load, carrying the robot around. So um, everything, you know, had a focus for, you know, sort of the usability in the, in the field. So one of the other things is, is just because the requirements come from the DOD doesn't mean they don't have applications in the commercial space. And so one of the things that we, we, we did is we interviewed a bunch of first responders like wildfire, fire, wild firefighters to get you know, sort of their, their take on you know, how they would use you know, a similar robot for their job. And they had some very interesting things such as being able to strap it to the bottom of the helicopter, or even you know, push it out with a parachute kind of thing. Um, that you know you you would hear from the military as well. So while we have you know sort of conceptualized this and modeled this this um, this robot and uh, and uh, 3D Studio Max, we we have yet to build it because to you know to build and deploy and test and deploy something like this would be a fairly extensive endeavor. That said, we have started making you know prototype versions based on what we can buy off the shelf. So you can see here one of my electrical engineers. You know, taking you know a, 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 a crate that we bought off online and, and, and putting some hoverboard wheels on it and and starting uh, to build a, a prototype that we can start experimenting with that uh, before we build the PCM. Um, but also, uh, because you know these systems can be so expensive and 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 and, and take a long time to to make and tune and stuff. To get started early, we ended up making what we call the, the Mark One, the Crow Mark One Rover, which is this you know, sort of very small scale, very cheap, you know, printable, easily assemble, uh, assemblable um, uh, little tester over here. And so is you know taking inspiration for the from the F one tenth guys. You know, it's is designed to sit on a uh, on a Traxxas Stampede RC chassis. It's got a, a number of different very configurable. Um, uh, subsystem. So we have sort of what we call the battery assembly there, which bolts on to the the, um, the powertrain of the, the the stampede, and then we have this processor assembly, which hosts at currently a, a 10 watt Jetson Nano, um, and that that's our sort of our, fav our favored processing uh, um, platform at the moment. But it can be configured with uh, different um, different um, systems. So for instance, this. This little thing here we call the wall. Uh, it has a an Adreno Nano on it right now for doing um, for for motor controls. But you can also uh, put a tray on it uh, where you can lay out more components and, and what have you. And then um, and then of course a lid and a, and a, and a, and a, 
a door here to close it up because you know being in the dirt and mud and, and water you know, you're trying to preserve your electronics as long as possible so here here's here's another one of the, the robots right here that um has a, a tray in it but instead of having the the adreno nano being the motor controller it's got a a, a series of PD, pdwm systems um mostly from you know the i2c you know spark fun uh, uh uh, uh, components, um, but you know, and then, then, then this would be the uh, the uh, the uh, compass on, on a mast, and you can use you know, either a, different types of compasses, or uh, and there's a GPS module here, the Spark Fun or the uh, Adafruit. This one has an, an, an antenna on it. But one of the things that I was talking about the cost complexity is this particular robot has the Intel tracking sensor and the Intel depth sensor. Of course, they're used for two different purposes. And this robot has has both, but um, when I talk about reducing the cost complexity, what I'm primarily talking about is that there are six or seven lens systems between these two guys, two USB cores. You know, they each have a processing module, and I believe we can replace all the cost complexity with one light field camera. And if I do that, then that means that the the, the robot can stay longer in the field. Um, and so, you know, everything about I mean, you know, these, these systems is about managing power as effectively as, as you can. Um, from, from sensors to, to processing to, uh, you know, how to drive the, the, the motors. Um, when I look at the individual, the systems of the, of the robot, they, they, there's some photographs from the various systems. So it's, again, like I said, it tracks a stampede here, stripped of body mounts. And, uh, and, and, and uh, other components. And then right here, whoops. The, uh, the, this module here is the, that battery subsystem and it, it supports these two 5,000 milliamp 7.2 volt batteries. Now there's one battery that is designed to be used with the, the uh, 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 electronic speed controller. So it's tied directly to there, but the other battery is for processing. And so it, it goes through this buck converter, which puts out you know, five volts on these two rails here. And the idea is if, you, if the robot is going hard all day, and you're running out of juice for your powertrain, then the robot can still be functioning because it has an independent power system for the, the processor. And then here, here again is, is, uh, is what the uh, system looks like without the tray and uh, an Adreno on the, uh, on the wall here. And then of course, a couple of blinky lights to give us some status there. Uh, and then the, this guy also has Wi-Fi uh, only for development. You have to keep in mind that one of the other reasons that the DOD really likes the light field uh, camera concept is it's passive. And passive means that it's not actively, you know, um, sending out signals. It's not actually, you know, painting a scene with an IR uh, pattern. Um, it's not actively broadcasting on Wi-Fi. If you do any of these things, it makes the robot easier to detect and target in the field, and that make you know puts the soldiers at risk because they they like the idea of being able to do everything passively. So you know uh, the Crow PCM could be constructed with or without uh, Wi-Fi, depending on their use cases. So when you when you look at the power problem, which is sort of the one of the dominant problems of, of the system, you know, one of the things that we did was took a look at processing, right? Processing power. And what we ended up doing was instead of using ROS, we designed a ground up operating system specifically designed for ARM processors. Now, um, the idea here was instead of having all the tasks spin up and, and, and send messages to each other, we decided that you would construct the task graph of, of operations that are linked to, uh, by, by um, these, these by, by graph edges. And then so the, the edges represent either data or execution dependencies. And so you'd create this task graph of what you want to do. And then you have this thread pool of, 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 of threads that you could dynamically assign to tasks as their dependencies are resolved. So for instance, when executing this task graph, T1 would be assigned to A, T2 would be assigned to B, and T3 would be assigned to C. Well, when one of these guys finishes, that task, that, that thread would be moved over to D. And when that one gets done too, then if one of these guys would be resolved, then the next free 
free thread would go to this task. And in this way, there are no spinning threads. There are no complex weighting sockets or signaling or locking mechanisms because all dependencies are to, uh, resolved by the execution of the task graph. Now, uh, like I said, instead of message passing, what we have within cross is sort of this global data cache. So as tasks within the graph execute, they either consume or produce data that goes into that common cache. And like I said, there are no requirements for locking that data because all the, the data dependencies are resolved by the task graph. Um, and so this makes a very easy, very configurable, very power friendly um, uh, way to execute you know, a series of very complex operations. And the other thing is, is you, know, you can imagine that when you deploy a robot into the field, that it doesn't need to be going 100% all the time. You know, if, if the soldier takes a break, then maybe the, 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 the robot needs to go into hibernation mode. And one of the easiest way to do that is just let it run one thread. And so instead of running at you know, 30 frames a second, maybe it's running at 10 frames a second um, you know, and, and saving all that power. Um, so one of the, a couple other things that are kind of nice about Cross is that all the data objects have a gra graphical representation. So you can configure Cross to put up a dashboard and, and see a rendering of all the data objects. And in that manner, you can see what Cross is doing dynamically at any one point in time. And then another Cross advantage is that you can mark uh, various data objects for publication, um, which can be encrypted uh, for secure communication between multiple different systems. But when you mark something for publication at the end of a execution cycle, that can be broadcast over TCP IP to any subscribed units. And so what often happens is when I'm running the Crow Mark I rover across the ground and doing my trail navigation research, I'm often following it uh, with a laptop running cross as well. And I'm, I'm broadcasting data that's being um, um, collected and, and analyzed on the on the rover, but I'm looking at it on the dashboard of, of, of my laptop very, very easily. So in this manner, you can have multiple uh, cross systems talk to talk to each other or, or, or not. Now this this task graph here um, is actually what, what is executing on this this robot right back here. So each, I have a number of these robots and each of them have a different purpose. So this this black one here is the one behind me is the one I'm using for uh, data collection. Uh, and then this, the orange one that I showed you guys here was that I use for uh, you know, integrating new components. And I got a, a few other ones around here for various other tasks. But as part of when you start up um, the, uh, the, um, the cross system, it reads its configuration and all the parameters you want from a JSON file and then generates this .gv file. So you can then print out a, a PNG of what task graph it's expecting to operate. And this is sort of a, a good way of debugging things and, and making sure that it's doing what you want all the time. Um, I threw these in here because they're just kind of nice. When I, when I started the, when I built my first uh, Crow uh, Mark I Rover, uh, it was you know on the same chassis, but it was a project box and a bunch of uh, plexiglass bolted bolted together, but I did your basic, you know, uh, line following test with, with cross, you know, with, with, the, with the painted painters tape in the middle of the street, you know, going through, um, you know, various, you know, there's differences in contrast and it speeds up and slows down depending on curves and or what it's, it detects it's on a straightaway or what have you. And that was kind of nice. And then the, the other thing that I did is one of the things that would be really nice about the Crow PCM is so the, if the, the, if the Crow PCM is following a soldier out in the field, uh, maybe the soldier would want to tell the robot to go back to maybe to where it started and get more gear. And that way, then the mule just becomes this autonomous you know, resupply system over a, a given trail. And so, you know, one of the things that happens is when, crop, when the Mark I is running, it's always collecting GPS uh, 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 coordinates, and then you can tell it to turn around and go follow, follow, uh, follow that, that breadcrumb trail. Now, this was when I first got it working, so there is no, and uh, working quotes, because there's no PID, there's no smoothing on either the, the steering angle velocity or, or even the GPS coordinates. So you can see that when this thing starts going, it's going to wobble all over the place as it locks on and to different waypoints and as the, you know, the GPS signal drifts around quite a bit. Um, and one of the funny things is, is that, you know, the, uh, 
the uh, the tracks of stampede can, I think can go like 30, 35 miles an hour. So I had to spend a lot of time throttling the speed of this thing because it would just literally take off and go over curbs and stuff like that as, as it wanted to. Um, but that was kind of that's that was kind of fun uh, to do. And then it, you know as it, as it records its GPS, you can see down here that it's not a particularly smooth um, um, uh, a path. So there's there's a lot of work that we need to do uh, uh, here to to make this a real real uh, a, a function of this robot to be able to you know retrace its stuff uh, uh, over a, a, a trail of GPS coordinates. Um, so on Pathfinder, so this is sort of the meat of the stuff I've been doing recently, especially in, in the COVID lockdown, I've had a lot of time to go collect data. So I, I've spent a lot of time over the, the past uh, couple of months uh, collecting data uh, and tra training data for the, for the robot system. So the idea of Pathfinder, Pathfinder executes as a node within the task graph and its purpose is to, is to determine the steering angle and, and velocity and a confidence value of those two, two, um, two uh, values um, so that the, that can be put into the navigation system of, of the robot. And so here I am, you know, you know, uh, training it to go, you know, train, collecting data for training to show what the robot can and cannot do, where it can and not, cannot go. And of course, I'm having to, you know, to collect this data over various types of, 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 of terrain. You know, basically, it's walkable hike and bike trail type terrain. Um, and we're currently using, you know, TensorFlow to train our convolutional neural networks with the idea that whatever we do still has to run within the confines of that that 10 watt processor. And of course, while I'm while I'm collecting all this training data, I'm, I'm collecting as as much information as I can: GPS, compass, my steering angles, depth images, stereo images, everything that I could possibly use later on. Um, so one of the, the ways we, we looked at the uh, the Pathfinder problem um, uh, was basically to decompose the 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 primary uh, EO RGB image that the the uh, that the robot collects. Now I'm not looking at the depth information yet, so I'm just looking at the the RGB imagery. But what we're doing right now is we're breaking up the the RGB image into a series of sub images, which we independently label with their, their whether they're navigable or not. So it's binary at the moment, and it, uh, it needs to be modified to be non-binary so that there are levels of navigability labels that you can establish, but it's binary now. And so we have this tool that we have that's user-driven that helps us segment out the, the, the terrain details into those various regions. And because there are literally hundreds of thousands of the images that are collected by these things, we have this two-stage training process. So we have this this, this CNN that we developed that is used to sort of train the next CNN, uh, another CNN that we actually actually run that we actually run on uh, Mark One Rover at the moment, um, and we call that second um, uh, we call this the second CNN the Phobe Terrain Classifier. So um, from from this segmented data, we get you know literally millions of these sub-image labels that are you know, valid, and, uh, and that are marked either valid or invalid. And then what we do is then we then on a desktop processor, we go through all the images that we collect and we convert every uh, RGB image into an image that looks like this without the red and the green, but a black and white image that basically we call the path of least resistance image. What this is supposed to represent is a, a grayscale uh, image of where you can and cannot go or where you should go in, uh, if, if you can. Um, and so that second CNN that we create uh, is designed to take this image and generate uh, a link to basically an image that one of these PLR images. And the reason that we're not, you know, having that classifier generate directly the the steering angle and, and velocity is because we may want to change that depending on the conditions that or you know, the runtime environment that the robot is in. Um, you know, consider that there are other atmospheric conditions that the thing 
the robot might be in. It might be dark, for instance, and the, we might have to enable an, uh, an infrared camera or something like that. And I would still want to generate the same type of PLR image from that, that data. So this is why we, we decompose you know, um, the problem into this two step. You know, first step is have a CNN that generates a PLR image. And the second step is analyze the PLR image for the type of conditions that you're, you're in. And currently this works within the confines of that 10 watt Jetson Nano at around 15 frames a second, which is you know, fast enough to keep up with a, a person walking under on, 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 these, on these trails. Um, when we started the Phobie Terrain Classifier work, we, um, we went and evaluated a lot of different type of CNN models that were out there. Um, and then we ranked the performance basically on the number of trainable perimeters, which we sort of uh, equate to um, at the moment um, speed. So that the fewer fewer perimeters that you have, the, the the faster that it goes. And then then of course, then you want them to be as accurate as possible. And so we ended up creating our own uh, CNN model, which we called our Phobie Train Classifier. Uh, which has really good performance for not a lot of perimeters. And so we're currently using that. And then we evaluated you know, the performance of these guys under different types of frameworks. Uh, uh, and then we settled on TensorFlow. And then we're currently using uh, OpenCV's inference engine to run the thing. And that, that works all very well for us at the moment. So one of the, the key things is, is um, <laughs> One of the, the, the weird things, yeah. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so this is actually an example of, um, of the phobie, uh, what, what the imagery looks like from the point of view of the robot when it's running uh, on the ground. And you can see it's kind of, it, it's kind of bounces around quite a bit. So you have to have this robot working when, when it's actually running around and it's bouncing around and, and hopping all over the trail. But the idea is, is from this imagery while, while you're going, you're generating this PLR image from which we can run different types of uh, um, pathfinding uh, algorithms on that PLR depending on the condition. So you can imagine that this green dot is where I'm supposed to be steering to in any particular image. And so the, the, the sort of the distance from the bottom of the image sort of can, can, can represent one uh, variable in, in determining speed. And of course the location you know, within the width of the image can help you determine the steering angle. And so what, what's happening with Pathfinder is the, the EO image goes into the, ETC, the FTC, comes out as, a, as this path of least resistance image and Pathfinder then says, go this way dependent on you know, these, you know, this POR image and, and, what it's, and what currently environment it's operating in. And that works, that works decently well for us. This is an example of the dashboard and why, and actually why, I'm, this is the thing I was gonna to talk to you previously about why I'm not using my steering angle and stuff and doing this two stage thing. One of the, the issues that I had when I was driving the, the, uh, the, the robot around is um, I'm six foot tall and I'm used to mountain biking and motorcycling. And so when I'm driving the robot, I'm actually, Personally, I'm looking like 15 to 20 feet down at the trail in, in, uh, in front of the robot. But from the perspective of the robot, it, it only really sees effectively about three or four, maybe five feet in front of itself. And so the steering angle that it wants to compute is based on a different set of data that I'm personally visualizing. And so that, that took us a little bit of, 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 of um, playing with to actually understand that you know steering angle that's good for the robot at any one point in time may not be the one that you know I'm, I'm picking at that moment in time uh, and so one of the things I'm doing here in the, in, the, in, the, in the dashboard is I'm comparing two different FTCs so I've collected the data on from the rover I put it over on my Windows PC and then I'm replaying it all and I'm loading up you know, and running different you know task configurations and cross trying to figure out, okay, what are the best FTC models? What are the best perimeters? And, and trying to see it. And in this particular test case, I just want to point out that, you know, there's sand in the trail, which means that I might want to have the speed of the robot, you know, the velocity of the wheels go up a little bit to, to maintain my momentum through this environment. So 
you know, we're, we're having to, you know, consider not only weather and, and contrast of the imagery, but we're having to look at the sort of what the ter terrain characteristics are and that, that have you to, to, you know, determine the optimum velocity and speed. And then when you put it all together, then you can get an image that looks like this. So this would be again, replaying it on the Windows PC, but it shows sort of how the, the, uh, the path of least resistance calculations being, you know, uh, derived from, you know, that subsample data set based on, you know, those, those sub image labels. Um, and I, I believe that that's the end of the, my, uh, my talk on the uh, on crow and cross and <laughs> and our pathfinder. I'd be happy to ask answer any questions. Okay. Uh, hey, Thomas. This is uh, C.J. Taylor. Thank you very much for uh, that part. I suspect there's a, a second part you're going to talk about as well, or yeah, I can talk about light field displays as well. Um, but I figured I'd stop here and just see if there's any cross and crow uh, questions. I mean, I, I see one here about considering issues with true off-roading with smallish wheeled vehicles, climbing hills and navigating forest trains and like, like that. I would just say that the, the, the goal of the, of the solicitation from the DOD was to be able to follow a trail, off-road trail. So it's not like free, free roaming um, uh, navigation. And like I said, what I'm, what I'm expecting to do is I'm, 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 I'm using the human person to do the heavy compute, right? All I have to do is follow them and not, you know, run into a rock or run into a lake or something. And so the, the, the degree of um, complexity goes uh, uh, down a lot from just having a free roaming for true off-roading, I would guess. Does that make sense? No, um, certainly. Uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering if, if you, uh, when you close the loop, uh, the way that you've described it, it's sort of uh, very much sort of done off of the, off of the current image. Uh, is, is there an advantage to using sort of multiple images or a bit of your history in order to do that? Or is that sort of done implicitly in the controller? Well, so there are, there are a couple of things I want to do. So th this first experiment, we're just using the EO imagery, right? To identify the trail. Um, the, the next, the next part of it would be to, to, like I said, uh, label the subregions with degrees of navigability because so, so that there are more options to choose from, right? So, so for instance, it's easy to, to identify the trail, let's just say, in some of those images, it's pretty obvious, right? Grass on the left and right side, there's trails in the middle, but from the trail in the middle, you might want to know if there's rocks or sand on one side and dirt on the other. So, we need to have, you know, to tune up the FTC to be able to, uh, you know, to do grayscale identification, let's just say. And then the, the, the next part of that is to build in the depth image data because there might be, um, it might be steep on one side of the trail or not steep on one side of the trail. And so I, I have the idea that the same type of classification system would actually work. So we run them in parallel and then combine the, the two two images that they get into yet another PLR image, I guess. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, no, certainly. Uh, I believe there's another uh, question in the chat from Sean. Yeah, and this, that's a, this is a really great, great question and uh, about what happens if the robot gets trapped. Well, so the idea is that because it's following a person, then the person can just help it over an obstacle or maybe tell it, you know, go this way or that way. And so that's why there's these big grab handles on the top of the robot. You know, ideally the robot is, you know, always being following someone. So the person's always there to help, but you don't necessarily want the person driving the robot because he has to be, you know, looking out for bad guys or, you know, doing his navigation or, or what have you. You don't want the, the robot interfering with his job. That doesn't mean that he can't be available to help the, draw, the robot occasionally to uh, get itself out of sticky situations. Yeah. What else? So I'm really curious about the other side of this, the, the getting a grant from the government to do this sort of work. Can you just speak briefly about what, what they ask for, what you promise, how that process develops, even how you just created the business in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll start with the SIBR program. 
So the, this SIBR program is, stands for Small Business Investigative Research. And it is designed for people like you guys when you wanna get out of college to, to start companies. And the idea is if, if, the, uh, if you have an idea, you can pitch it to the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, or what have you, to their SIBR programs for solicitation, which means that you know, a couple times a year, they will produce you know, a couple hundred topics for research. Now, you can propose, but normally they have a bunch of topics. You know, they, and they range from anything from you know, how to shoot down a drone you know, to you know, materials research to you know, cyber war, warfare research. So they have all these topics. And you as a small business, you know, and, and there's rules for what, if, what is a small business can propose solutions to the topics that they, they are, they're asking for work on. Uh, and so normally uh, uh, about uh, three times a year, I, I write probably a half a dozen uh, to a dozen proposals. They're 20 pages long. They're usually something I have to be somewhat of a subject domain expert in. So they're usually about displays or you know, efficient you know, GPU computing or something that's you know, uh, light field image processing, let's just say. Something I have a, a leg up or an advantage on or domain knowledge so that I can write a reasonably good proposal in a short time. And then they're competitive. So you might get you know, the, 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 the POC, the point of contact for the army who proposes a particular or you know, writes a particular solicitation might get you know, dozens and dozens of uh, put, uh, proposals in which they usually pick you know, one, two or three to award fairly small contracts to let's say $150,000 for you know, a year of work or something like that. And then you can use that to uh, research that particular topic. And then sometimes there's a phase two, which you can get up to a million dollars to continue the research and development on that topic. And so, um, so that would be the SIBR program. There are other programs, the, the broad area announcements and more like what I like um, that, that come from the same agencies that are, you know, they're, they're sort of bigger, they're more complex and they're more competitive because uh, bigger companies can get into them such as the Lockheeds and the you know, General, Mark, General Electrics and those kind of guys. So you're then competing with the big guys. So Lockheed, for instance, cannot bid on a cyber program, but they can bid on a BAA, which means you're in competition with those guys. And they have track records and you know, proven technology. <laughs> and then, the, uh, then there's DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Program Agency, and, and, and our, our, our which is, I think, the Intelligence Advanced Research Programs. These are kind of different. They're, they're a lot farther leaning. They can, they can be a lot harder topics. They have a little bit different rule set. So um, DARPA can often take the money away from you if you're underperforming on a project, whereas on the BAAs, I don't think that's as easy to do. Um, and then the expectation with DARPA is, is a little bit, a little bit um, more severe. You know, it's either uh, produce or, or we'll cut you loose kind of thing. Um, and uh, those can be quite fun because they're also a lot, you know, a lot harder topics, but there's a little bit more stress. So you can, you can, you can start a company on these kind of things, but you really cannot survive as a company on these type of programs. So you, you must bring in other, other types of work, uh, you know, commercial contracts, commercial research. So my company does, you know, light field display research development for outside big, big companies as well. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's a ton of information. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's fun, actually. I, I, I enjoyed, I've enjoyed the SIBR program because some of the topics and some of the requirements, I mean, I, I will tell you, you know, you, you guys, and me too, right? I, I, I went to school and they teach us a lot of stuff. Um, and then they, the government will always throw a curveball at you, right? You know, like the compute thing, it's a big curveball because you know, as a researcher, you sometimes think, well, great, great. you know, I, I got this cluster in the cloud, I can use it, right? And the DOD will say, well, you can't send any data off your robot. You can't use the cloud. You can't do this. You can't do that. And they have the reasons, but they make the engineering challenge harder. And it always comes down to size, weight, and power of the engineering effort, right? Which, which in school, we don't often think about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Yeah, of course. What else?
Okay, well, if you guys want, I'd be happy to talk about light field displays for a few minutes. I'm curious, that would be great. <laughs> okay, I just need one, one person to say yes. <laughs> so, uh, so here on this slide here, um, people often ask me, you know, what is a light field display? And the way I like to, to talk about it, or at least to start the conversation is, is just to remind people that when they are seeing things, wherever they are, they're, they're seeing reflected light from objects in their surrounding that, you know, impinges on their eyeball and creates this inverted retinal image of the scene in front of them. From, and then for your human visual system then reconstructs this 3D scene in front of you. Um, and so if, if there was not an object in front of you reflecting light, and instead there was a surface that could generate a, the same ray information that represents that reflected light and paint that same inverted retinal image on the back of your hip, the eyeball, then the human visual system will perceive a 3D aerial object, whether that thing is there or not. And so we're not trying to fool the human visual system into perceiving 3D. We're trying to give the human visual system exactly what it needs to see 3D naturally. Uh, and, in, 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 and if it's natural, then you also don't get the nausea-inducing artifacts that you can get uh, when you look at like through head-mounted displays or other types of 3D displays that don't generate perspective correct ray information. And the idea is, is, is basically, you know, we are 3D creatures. We're used to interacting and living in a 3D world. And the idea is if you can project a 3D scene, then you can, you know, uh, use your worldly experience to uh, decompose that information and, and create, you know, better, you know, better, faster decisions. And, and I would just point out that this is the scenario you see in every science fiction movie. So whether it's Star Wars or Prometheus or Avatar or Alien, what have you, it, you know, they always have these scenes where they have this 3D graphic of the battle going on, you know, and there's a bunch of people surrounding it, you know, each with different roles trying to contribute, you know, from their perspective, uh, what they should do about, you know, how to shoot the Death Star or what have you, right? And so they're all trying to analyze this complex, you know, scenario and, 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 and derive a, a common understanding of what to do. And so that, that's, that's the significance of light field displays. The DOD wants that battle space display, and that's primarily we get, where we get a lot of our funding to go do. So yeah, it's kind of a cool gig. So one of the, the things I like to say, one of the things is, well, what's, what's, what can you use it for with the light field display? And I, I like to point out that the 2D display, which you're watching me uh, at the moment, was not used, not made specifically for Zoom. It's application agnostic. You can use it for Zoom, surfing the web. You can use it for playing games. It doesn't matter, right? So it's just a 2D canvas. Well, the 3D display is the same idea. It just requires 3D data. And as long as we can improve the interaction with the 3D data, the ability to collaborate over 3D data, and the, you know, ability to visualize, you know, render that 3D data, then it has a lot of application, you know, potential in a lot of different types of markets, whether it's entertainment or defense or medical or what have you. So, so what is a light field? So again, going back to the volume that you're currently in. I'm assuming you guys are mostly in a room, let's just say. That's a volume of light that's bouncing around in that, that room. And so a light field would be a capture of the ray information in that room. So if you take the room that you're in and you bisect it by a plane and you capture the rays that are going through that, that plane, then every pixel would represent the, the position and direction of or orientation of a ray uh, in that plane. And that would be a capture of the light field or what we call a radiance image. Uh, and so you can consider a radiance image to be a raster description of a light field. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, light field cameras capture 3D information onto the radiance image. A light field display would take the radiance image and reconstruct a 3D aerial image from that information. Now, like I said, the light field camera captures radiance image, but we don't capture real light from real cameras. What we do is we take a model of the scene and we render the radiance image. So we render what we call the synthetic radiance image. But whether you have an actual radiance image captured from real light or a synthetic radiance image, 
both of these images can be projected through an array of microlenses to angular distribute light. So you can imagine that these micro, the light would come off the radiance image and you want to project it over a field of view. And so we consider the, the, the micro lens itself to be what we call Hogel, the holographic element. And then the micro image that represents the ray information for that particular image is also part of that Hogel. It represents all the, the light on that uh, point spot on the holographic surface. So um, we have a proven architecture. We've generated a number of different display architectures. And the, the, the basic subsystem sub assemblies are, are this. So uh, in our system, you have to have some mechanism of generating the light field. So we use an array of GPUs. Uh, right now that take a model and compute the synthetic radiance image. But once you do that, you have to have a way of converting the pixelized ray of, in, ray of information into actual rays. And so for that, we use an array of uh, micro displays uh, to convert the, the pixels into actual rays of light. And then we have an array of micro, image, micro lenses on top of that that are used to angular distribute the light. And so those are the primary subsystems. This, uh, this assembly here is what we have inside of what we call our DK2, which is the highest resolution light field display ever demonstrated. And it generates this monochrome image. So there's an actual image from, from uh, one of our DK2s of Einstein there. We've also, like I said, we do commercial contracts. So we've built a number of different displays or components for other people. Usually under NDA, I can't physically show it to you, but there are some images right there of one of the ones we built for someone else of a, of a color display. And so these are these are actual images. These are not Photoshopped. And I can guarantee you that when you look at people who compete with us, they dink their images in Photoshop to make them look good. We did not. So anyway, guys, that's that's what I have on light field displays. That's our crow cross and light field display programs. And I'd be happy to ask answer any more questions if you have them. So were those lenses at fixed angles and you're essentially choosing which lens you want to put light into to get that angle? That's correct. Yeah. So to get, what is the multiple of resolution you need in the first stage to get a light field resolution out at the end? Oh uh, yeah. So this is uh, what we call the spatial angular trade. And this is actually the problem that Lytro and all the other light field camera guys have is you have to capture a large number of rays to generate good images. Um, so for us, um, there are two main factors in resolution. There's what you call the angular resolution, which is sort of the degrees per pixel, right? And then you have the spatial resolution of the micro lens array itself, which sort of determines your, the spatial, the, the smallest resolvable uh, object. So consider this, you have a, a, an array of micro lenses, but from any perspective, when you're looking into the light field display, you're only seeing one ray ish from each micro lens, right? So that determines the spatial resolution of the scene that you're seeing. The smallest thing you can see is defined by the diameter of the micro lens or the micro lens pitch, right? So you, it's hard to reserve fine detail like hair on someone's head or something like that, but you can obviously see faces and stuff like that. Does that make sense? And then the angular resolution kind of gives you an idea of how high it can project or how deep the whole system can project. Um, and so um, now given a set of pixels, you have to determine how the pixels are going to contribute. Do you want to make you want to maximize your spatial resolution, have a very shallow image, or do you want to maximize your depth and have a very uh, small image depending on your pixel density, I guess. Does that make sense? That makes sense. It's really, really neat. Yeah, thanks. Great. All right. Oh. We might have one more question. Yeah. So here, here's, here's the, the thing about 3D displays. There is no display technology that actually produces a image in space that is perspective correct. What, what I mean by that is like, say when you look at the display that have an avatar, they're always looking across the, the display and it shows the big tree and the, you can see other people on the side of the display. Um, for that to happen, you'd have to be able to turn light in mid space, depending on your, all the viewers and that's just physically impossible. So in all 
display technologies, you actually have to look into the projection system, okay? And because we are painting different rays on each eyeball, and because you have really good motion parallax, you will perceive a 3D aerial object. So you won't see the thing hover above the screen, but when you look into the display, it'll appear 3D with all the essential depth cues. And what I mean by that is there are depth cues that you take for granted. It's like gradient shading, specular highlights, you know, obviously parallax. Um, you'll get all that when you look into the display, but it won't appear above between, say, me and you looking over a display like they show in movies. It looks more like the Prometheus display. Have you ever seen that display where she looks? Well, I guess there are some bad examples of Prometheus, but in the movie Prometheus, Sirly Theron primarily is looking into the into the display volume and, and for which you see, and you can see that she's seeing something there, I guess is the best way to put it. All right. That's wonderful. Any last minute questions before we sign off? Thomas, I just wanna thank you for a wonderful presentation. This was very interesting. We appreciate your time on behalf of the Grass Lab and all of our researchers. Um, all right, thank you guys, no problem. All right, enjoy everyone. Have a great rest of your day. All right, bye-bye. Okay, 